The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are so delighted that you have chosen to worship with us here at River Road Presbyterian Church this morning. I invite you all to join me now in prayer. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet. So open our hearts and minds through the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. Listen for the word of the Lord. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. When was the last time you took a personality test? Maybe it was something you had to do for work as part of a team building exercise. Or maybe it's something you're doing privately in counseling, a way to grow and learn about yourself. Or maybe you were just trying to kill some time on social media and you took one of those little fun quizzes or tests to learn which kind of car you are or which type of brand of cereal best represents your personality. Be careful with those tests, by the way, folks. Those are often traps set by hackers who are looking to get just enough information about you to hack into your accounts. In fact, I gotta say, that's something they never prepared me for in seminary. How on an almost daily basis I have to turn down friend requests from church members who clearly have been hacked. Be careful with those tests and quizzes, y'all. I mean it. Speaking of seminary, when I was going through the ordination process, I had to take a slew of personality tests. I also had to sit down with a licensed counselor to review the results of those tests. It was a really interesting experience, and I learned a lot about myself, about the types of ministry that I might thrive in, and the types of ministry I would have a more difficult time with. But there's a part of our conversation that always causes me to chuckle when I think about it. At one point, my counselor looked up from a stack of paper and said, according to this test, you have what we call a prophetic personality. Hmm. I thought, with genuine curiosity, well, what does that mean? And she said, basically, it means that when you perceive there to be a problem, you have a hard time keeping your mouth shut. It also means that you are comfortable discussing difficult topics, and you try to nip problems in the bud before they get out of control. Now, while that sounded like a lofty title at first, rest assured that my counselor quickly disabused me of any notion that having a prophetic personality was something I should let go to my head. You see, she went on to say that one of the problems you'll face is that you'll want to talk about things before other people are ready. And you'll get frustrated and impatient. And you'll get especially frustrated when they're not yet ready to even admit that there's a problem to talk about at all. On top of that, there's the bigger problem that sometimes you will be flat out wrong in your analysis of a situation. Prophetic personalities have a tendency to jump to conclusions with limited evidence. Guilty as charged, I admitted to her. And any lingering romantic notions about having a prophetic personality were well and truly squashed on my ride home. 
You see, I called up a trusted mentor to process some of my experience. And when I told him about this conversation about having a prophetic personality, he chuckled and said, does that just mean you're a jerk? Our scripture lesson this morning from the book of Amos reminds us that prophets can be abrasive personalities. In fact, Amos was kind of the template of the angry prophet. A voice so loud, so aggressive, so confrontational that his righteous indignation still has the power to pour off the page and grip us when we read it. In fact, I think everyone should sit down and read the book of Amos at least once a year just to be reminded of the beauty and the power of the prophetic tradition of the Hebrew Bible. Plus, it's a lot shorter than the book of Jeremiah. Now, the central message behind Amos' prophetic career was this. Thanks to a period of relative peace and prosperity, at least for some, the people of Israel had lulled themselves into a kind of spiritual complacency. They'd begun to take for granted their status as God's chosen people, and they had begun to neglect their obligations to live a life of covenant faithfulness, a life characterized by justice and righteousness, especially in regard to how one treated the poor, the oppressed, and the vulnerable. According to Amos, God had taken notice that Israel had grown complacent, and that Israel was straying away from the covenant, and God was beginning to lose patience. That's where this vision of the plumb line comes in. A plumb line is a kind of measuring tool, basically a rope or a piece of string with a heavy metal weight at the bottom. And you can hold this string up and let gravity do its work, and that string will offer you a straight line. You can then take that string and hold it up next to a wall or a building to determine if the walls are straight and sound or if they're crooked or possibly headed for a collapse. Now for Amos, that plumb line was the covenant, the way of life God had called the people to, a way of life embodied by justice and righteousness, justice and righteousness made possible through the generosity and grace and love of God. But that plumb line revealed that Israel had indeed grown crooked. You see, despite their sense that everything was just fine and dandy, thank you very much, that plumb line was unyielding in its honesty, revealing that the people had indeed strayed away from Yahweh's way of life. And Amos' efforts to stir them awake from their complacency and self-deception didn't exactly get a warm reception, at least from the religious authorities in Israel of the time. And that's where this interesting figure of Amaziah steps in. Amaziah was the high priest in charge of the sanctuary at Bethel, the king's favorite place to go and worship. And if Amos represents the template of the rabble-rousing, muck-raking prophet, then Amaziah is the template of the rigid religious authority. He represents the religious and political status quo. He's kind of ecclesiastical bouncer, ready to toss out any troublemakers. He also provides us with a template or a playbook for how to deal with loudmouth prophets like Amos. For example, Notice how he subtly tweaks Amos' message when he goes to make his report to the king, King Jeroboam. He says, For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from his land. That's a pretty clever strategy on Amaziah's part. Notice how he robs Amos' message of all of its theological content. There's no hint that this might be a message coming from God through Amos to the king and to the people. In fact, he makes it seem like Amos is just another political malcontent making threats about a political assassination. And he also robs Amos' message of its ethical heartbeat. There's no notion of Amos' criticism of the economic exploitation and oppression happening under the reign of the king. That's how you deal with a prophet. You twist their words and make them say things that they never actually said, things so outrageous and outlandish that no sane or faithful or moral person could possibly agree with them. But distortion and misrepresentation aren't the only tools that Amaziah has when dealing with prophets. Notice what he says when he finally goes and confronts Amos one-on-one. -on -one. He says, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Now it's possible to read this little exchange in two distinct ways. The first way of interpreting it is to suggest that Amaziah really is that kind of ecclesiastical bouncer. This is him saying, get out and stay out. You are not welcome here at Bethel. But some commentators suggest that Amaziah might be a little more subtle here, a little more indirect, a little more passive-aggressive and manipulative. 
instead of being confrontational, he goes to Amos and just says, Hey, seer, things are getting a little hot around here. We're starting to get some letters of complaint. You might want to move on. You might want to go back to Judah before things get a little uncomfortable for you around here. We might kind of call this the kind of uh, offer of a false peace, an attempt to stamp out the conflict and let Amos know that he's not welcome without causing any additional controversy. Notice how Amaziah doesn't actually challenge Amos on the content of his message when he finally faces him one-on-one. -on -one. This is kind of a way of saying like, hey man, it's not so much what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. Maybe we aren't really your, your audience. Maybe you should go back to Judah, back where people are a little more receptive to this kind of thing in your style. Good luck to you. But Amos does not play that game. He doesn't play that game because he knows that the stakes are too high. And he doesn't play that game because he also knows that in the grand scheme of things, the excuse that you didn't accept the message because you didn't like the style of the messenger isn't going to cut it with God. We Christians also need to keep in mind that Jesus Christ had a similar message as Amos. And Jesus Christ could also be rather confrontational and direct and could stir things up from time to time. But Christ also had a ministry that was marked by kindness compassion, healing, and friendship. And we killed him. You know, maybe we just need to admit to ourselves that we're really good at finding excuses not to listen to difficult truths or difficult messages that we just don't want to hear. And in this regard, personality tests aside, I realize that I am not really like Amos. I am much more like Amaziah. I mean, for starters, I am a religious official. I am partly responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of a beautiful sanctuary. But more importantly, like Amaziah, when I am confronted with truths that I don't want to face, from messengers I don't particularly like, I can get defensive. I can shut down. I can find all sorts of excuses and reasons not to listen to what God might be trying to say to me through that person. I may be comfortable being a prophetic personality for you and encouraging you to uh, face some of the difficult issues in your life, but don't you dare try to do the same thing to me. We Amaziahs need to be careful right now. We need to figure out how to keep an open heart and an open mind. Because in times of crisis or uncertainty or transition, our ability to listen and learn may make the difference between growth or stagnation, between life death. We need to be careful because the plumb line has been dropped down into our community and it is revealing to us whether we are standing up straight or starting to lean towards some disaster. For almost the plumb line was covenant faithfulness. We Christians have an additional plumb line. The plumb line is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ, whose life, death, and resurrection have shown us a way to live and have given us a measure so that we can determine if we are following God's path in our lives or if we have grown crooked and ready to crumble. Every day we are given the opportunity to measure our lives against the plumb line of Jesus Christ. Every day we are invited to ask ourselves truly, if we are living the way of life that Christ has revealed to us, that Christ has made possible for us. Every day we can ask ourselves if we are praying for our enemies and practicing forgiveness, or if we are nursing our grudges and using them as a rationale to lash out at each other. We can ask ourselves if we're practicing repentance, owning up when we are in the wrong, or if we are spending all our time and energy in self-justification or in blaming other people. We can ask ourselves if we are bringing our challenges, our obstacles, our difficulties as individuals or as a community out into the healing light of the Spirit, or if we are instead trying to maneuver in the dark to avoid conflict, to avoid discomfort, to avoid all those things that cause us anger, anxiety, or shame. Christ promised to be with us until the end of the age. But sometimes God reminds us of God's presence with us by sending people into our lives who challenge us to ask ourselves difficult questions and to face difficult truths, all in an effort to call us back to the life of faithfulness. Sometimes it's a trusted friend. Sometimes it's a mentor, a teacher, maybe a therapist or a pastor. 
And sometimes, yes, it's that person who drives you nuts, but when you really stop and think about what they said, you have to admit that they have a point. And when those people enter into our lives, may we have the grace to pause and to pray. May we have the grace to sit back and wonder and ask ourselves what the Spirit might be up to through that person. And may we have the grace to be grateful for the fact that their presence in our lives is a reminder that God has not abandoned us. That God is still present with us, sending people into our lives to invite us to grow and to learn and to live deeper together into this life of faith. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. As always, we encourage you to share this service with your friends, family, and neighbors by clicking the share button on your screen. We also have a couple exciting announcements to share with you today. First, we want to remind you that signups are still live online for our upcoming Vacation Bible School. So please go to our website for more information about that, and please be sure to encourage any of your neighbors or friends who may be interested in that wonderful program. And now we have a special announcement from Andrew Sanders for the Martin B. Williams class. Good morning, I'm Andrew Sanders. Uh, I'm one of the teachers in the Martin B. Williams class, and I wanted to give you heads up about an opportunity you may have seen in your emails. Uh, we've been through a lot lately. COVID, politics, changes at work, changes at home, and physical separation from each other. So the Martin B. Williams class thought we might try to do something about that. And so we're gonna take just a bit of the summer, the last two Sundays in July and the first three in August, and do sort of a throwback to old time vacation Bible school. So I'm going to be teaching a series of five classes starting on July 18th about some of our favorite miracle stories in the Bible. Uh, really, my favorite miracle stories. Uh, the first is gonna be July 18th. We're gonna go back to where it all began, the wedding at Cana. In the next two weeks, we're gonna talk about the first three healing stories of Jesus and then the feeding of the 5,000. And the last two Sundays, we're going to be talking about my two favorite Bible stories. The story of Jairus and his daughter, perhaps Jesus' most tender miracle. And then the book in fishing miracles and the redemption of Peter. I promise you that these are really good Bible stories. And I promise you that we're going to sing some really good old hymns. And I promise you that we will share some good fellowship. You know, we've been separated from each other for a long time and we've missed seeing each other. This is a great way to reconnect, to share witness to our Lord and be with each other. So I hope that you will join us for at least a Sunday or two in July and August. And I hope to see you then. Thank you. Now friends, go out into the world in peace in the sure knowledge that you are a beloved child of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God be with you and those you love this day henceforth and forevermore. Amen.